I'm your host, Gary Baumgartner. Well, we all know there needs to be no setup from me about the situation between the United States and Iraq. The saber rattling is uh, reaching a, a fever pitch. We already hear the new Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom talking about how a military strike may be necessary. The rhetoric is not at all dissimilar to what we heard prior to the invasion of Iraq, and it's causing many people to wonder, is a war with Iran inevitable? Well, uh, we know that Iran is building nuclear weapons. We know that they are being uh, obstructionist, Tehran is, when it comes to uh, letting the inspectors get in there and see what they're doing and dismantling their nuclear weapons uh, program. They claim uh, that they are uh, only uh, developing uh, nuclear uh, capabilities for energy purposes. Well, joining us to put this all into perspective is Dr. Baram Raji. He is a senior policy consultant for the National Iranian American Council. Uh, Dr. Raji specializes in Iranian politics and foreign policy, the evolution of U.S. strategic and foreign policy in Southwest Asia, and U.S.-Iranian relations. His most recent research focuses on how Iran's political elite are factionalized, which I find extremely interesting because uh, Dr. Raji, first I want to uh, welcome you to News Talk Online on PalTalk.com and get right to it. I have always said, I have always believed, I've sir, always that, believed um, sir, that, that there is a problem. Is a We're getting uh, a loop through, Boaz. I'm hearing myself come back at me. Thank you. Um, if, um, uh, if there is a problem that we have with Tehran, it is really not with the Iranian people, who I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, are by and large not uh, supportive of this particular theocracy the, uh, regime that is going on in Iran right now. Is that a fair assessment? Is that a fair assessment? Um, yeah, by and large, it's, it's a fair assessment, Gary. And I just want to say it's nice to be with you um, and the listeners. Uh, I, I think that uh, what we're seeing, and this sort of leads to my interest in the factionalization of Iran's political elite, uh, is a re post-revolutionary system in Iran that, since the death of Ayatollah Khomeini, has really developed some pronounced fissures among the officials at the top of the government. And there's, you know, historical, a historical basis for this that goes before, uh, precedes the 1979 revolution, but it's really come to the forefront and is being played out across a lot of policy issues and in a lot of contexts in Iran uh, since the late 80s or so. And uh, to move up to the current times, we're seeing it played out very directly in the aftermath of 9-11 with regard to different comments made by different Iranian officials about U.S.-Iran relations, the Iraq uh, war, Afghanistan, the war on terror, et cetera. So, and the nuclear issue, of course. Well, I find it extremely, well, find it extremely interesting. interesting. Wow. Let me see if I can fix this on my end. Boaz is insistent that the problem is on my end. I don't, I don't know why I'm causing this loop through to occur, Boaz. I apologize if it is on my end, but my settings look accurate here. I don't know. But we'll, we'll uh, struggle our way through this. Um, I, I find it very interesting that the elite in Iran uh, uh, see things uh, in, in uh, do not, are not obviously monolithic about their, their, their view of things. Now, if they are indeed the elite, do those who hear that the, the path that Ahmadinejad is taking Iran is only a path to disaster, do they have any influence? Can they internally obviate the situation before it becomes a case of a military strike? Uh, my reading of the situation is that they can, uh, that the victory of the, for lack of a better word, uh, the sort of neocons in the Iranian context, which is Ahmadinejad and his group, sort of a throwback to the radical ideologues of the early 1980s of Iranian revolutionary politics in a new form with some new and dangerous wrinkles that we can talk about, uh, particularly ties to the military, et cetera, um, or the Revolutionary Guards and some other paramilitary forces associated with the regime. Um, their victory is not uh, um, predetermined. And Ahmadinejad's sort of emergence was quite rapid and surprised many people. And uh, it was directly tied to the extent to which the last round of presidential elections were widely seen to be control tightly controlled and manipulated uh, at the, in the worst instances. And I think there's some evidence for that, um, particularly in the second round of elections that, that were held, that propelled them to the presidency. And I think more importantly, you're seeing in Iran a very pronounced backlash against them, taking the form of a couple things that uh, the listeners may have caught uh, just a few days ago, maybe even been yesterday, the former Iranian uh, 
a former national security official really lambasted Ahmadinejad uh, and didn't name him by name, but it was very quite clear who he was talking about. Um, and then we're seeing different segments of the Iranian population protest, uh, students calling him dictator, uh, teachers and truck drivers going on strike and blaming him quite directly in some senses for what their, their plight. So, um, and then, of course, there's the kind of gradual realignment of the pragmatist core of the Iranian political system, as such as it is today, headed by uh, Rafsanjani, uh, the former president um, and now chair of several quite powerful non-elected bodies. So you see this kind of happening on a multiple uh, levels at the same time. Yeah, and Dr. Baram Raji, the senior policy consultant for the National Iranian American Council, is my guest. And, you know, I'm, it's interesting what you just uh, referred to. It seems to me that Ahmadinejad, uh, with the exception of when he was laughed at when he claimed that there are no gays in Iran, uh, received a better reception at Columbia University than he did when he addressed the university there in Iran just the other day. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of... <laughs> Ironic, and of course, his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, the Iranian government has sort of issued a clarification in the last week saying he just meant that we don't have as many gays in Iran as there are in the U.S., which to anyone who listened to the actual speech strikes you as quite untrue. That's not clearly not what he said, <laughs> even if he thought that's what he said. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, there are certain segments of the Iranian population, the students are, are being quite sort of um, uh, repressed in some ways in the last 10 years quite directly by the regime and are much less powerful of forces they were, say, eight or nine years ago. Uh, but there's some segments of them still do not shy away from voicing their dissent. And uh, that, I think, in some sense is a very good thing for Iranian politics, but these students and their families pay a very heavy price for this. You know, and, and I was just going to lead to that as well. Uh, they are very uh, much putting their lives, or at the very least, their liberties and the liberties of their families on the line, are they not, uh, by uh, speaking out the way they do, the dissident uh, students? And, um, and uh, this is a, actually quite a dilemma, not only for the Iranian sort of reformist or pro-democracy movement, and it's very sort of uh, widespread and deeply rooted uh, at this point in the sense that the government cannot just simply make it go away, uh, but it can, of course, bash it in the head when it rears up uh, to oppose them on certain points, which it does not shy away from doing. Um, but it's also a dilemma for the United States as to how to encourage democracy in Iran uh, without actually costing these people their very livelihood and, and or lives in certain instances. And uh, we're seeing this played out right now about the current allocations for democracy promotion in Iran, uh, which is now being debated in Congress, and there's a lot of um, interest on how, what course this ultimate policy is going to take, because the activists in Iran themselves have quite clearly stated that they don't want the U.S. to be in the business of providing money for democracy promotion, because it, essentially, in their own words, it paints a target on their backs and makes it that much easier for the government to simply accuse them, whether it's real or not of being in, in cahoots with the United States to overthrow the government. As we saw played out with the um, four or five Iranian American scholars and uh, various visitors to Iran that were incarcerated. Well, my guess is, and you can understand that by the way, because of course the Shah was supported by the United States and look what happened to him and look what look the mess they're in now. So if, if it's something that uh, they can do internally themselves, obviously, the whole world would be a, a better place as a result of that. Dr. Bahram Araji, the senior policy consultant for the National Iranian American Council, is my guest. There are a number of people already uh, anxious to talk to you. So uh, let's get to uh, the first caller. I'm told the first caller 